Hello, uh, my name is Paul Gilbert and president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation. And today it's the 6th of January, 2023. And I'm delighted to have with me today, the wonderful Tanya Singer, who's one of the major international researchers on compassion. And so before we start, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her. So here we are. Now, Tanya is professor of social neuroscience and psychology and heads the Max Planck Society's Social Neuroscience Lab in Berlin. After her PhD in psychology at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, she worked at the Wellcome Center for Imaging Neuroscience at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in London and held the inaugural chair of social neuroscience and neuroeconomics at the University of Zurich, where I actually met her and it's a wonderful city. Uh, she is a world expert on compassion and empathy and has a passion for creating bridges between fields that typically never interact. Her research focus is on the hormonal, neuronal, and developmental basis of human sociality, empathy and compassion, and their malleability through mental training. She has initiated and headed one of the largest meditation-based secular mental training studies on compassion, the Resource Project. Linking such findings to the field of neuroeconomics, she has developed caring economics approach, developing new models of economy based on care and social cohesion. She is also heading the co-social, the Cove, I should say, Cove's social project, a large-scale study on stress, resilience, and social co cohesion in Berliners during the COVID crisis. Tanya Singer is author of more than 160 scientific articles and book chapters and edited together with Matthew Ricard the two books, Caring Economics in 2015 and The Power and Care in 2019, summarizing two conferences that they had organized with the Dalai Lama in Zurich and Brussels. Throughout her life, she has explored how inner change can bring about societal change putting science in the service of social societal transformation. Tanya, welcome. What a delight to have you and what a fantastic uh, a focus for your life. So let me start off by asking you, so how did you become interested in compassion? How did you get interested in looking at compassion? What interested you in be, being a compassion researcher? <laughs> Hi, Paul. First of all, thanks for this opportunity to interact with you again. Uh, as you just said, right, our roots go a long time, like we met in Zurich. It was like around 2006, I think, or seven. And, and since our path has crossed again and again, right? So how did I get interested in compassion? It was actually through my work first, but I think probably, uh, you know, um, empathy and compassion, I guess, were topics already implanted in my youth um, because I grew up with a, you know, monozygotic twin. So I, I grew up with a we, you know, like with an identity which was very closely intertwined with another being. And so when I studied psychology and like cognitive psychology and so on, I was always feeling something is missing, right? The social aspect of us humans in these early, you know, cognitive psychology days. So I went to London and to study actually neuroscience and empathy. And I did these first empathy in neuroscience experiment around, you know, the, the, the break of the century um, because I was interested in our social brains, right? Like how do we feel with others and, and so on. And at that time I was actually, uh, uh, you know, doing research on empathy. And I only discovered the difference between empathy and compassion much later. Uh, it was a journey. And so through my empathy research, I, I, did, I came to discover more and more the, the you know, the, the force of compassion and the difference between empathy and compassion, which became a, a focus of my research for many years. And that coincided with the, um, the meeting of the Mind and Life Institute and the whole network around it. And this is an institute which um, was founded by the Dalai Lama and Francisco Varela in the 80s and is fostering the dialogue between Western science and, you know, Eastern contemplative tradition. And I myself was always super interested in consciousness, you know, and how to alter it. So I did a lot of retreats in private life very early on. 
And so then this Mighty Life Institute came and I met all these compassionistas, you know, like these expert Buddhist practitioner who devoted their life to compassion. And so a lot of different pieces came actually together to then turn my focus completely on how to train compassion and how to, you know, devise secular mental training programs who foster compassion uh, and, and, you know, devise a lot of training studies and doing science around that. Yes, and you've always been a, a person that likes to bring people together. I mean, you did a lot of work with our friend Matthew Ricard, and I remember we had this fantastic meeting in Berlin, where again, you brought a lot of people together for a conference, and uh, and then you produce this brilliant ebook with all these different contributions. So that is something that you obviously like doing as well, is bringing lots of different people together to talk about these kind of key themes. Huh? Yeah, that's true. That's uh, another memory we share, right? It was a um, you know, how to train compassion conference, and I remember I, w I had just moved from Zurich to to um, Berlin, uh, becoming um, you know a, a director at the Max Planck in Leipzig in Berlin, and so I. I was planning this nine months resource project you mentioned in my CV, this huge longitudinal compassion mental training study. And so I, I, I wanted to get experts in compassion all together, because if you remember at that time, mindfulness was out there, but not, but much less, you know, compassion based eight week program that was like grassroots movement, no? And so I remember I, I reached out to you and to Mathieu and to John Halifax and to all very busy people. And you know, with doodles, and usually you 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 know, doodles are never converging, especially when people are busy like two years in advance. And that was like a magic moment. Um, everyone converged on one week in you know in summer, and and just six months before, so we had this amazing convergence of these amazing minds. And then Olaf Eliasson, who is an artist, and I was in contact with him because he was interested in felt feelings, empathy, and for for an Olympia project he was actually preparing. And so he said, wow, all these compassion experts coming into town, I could learn, right? Arts and science could be bridged as well, because he is also a bridge builder between society and art. And so he offered his studio. So what happened is that we all ended up in his incredible, no artistic studio in um in, in Berlin to basically have this one week amazing conference on, you know, how to train compassion, what are the obstacle, what can work and really have this intense workshop with people who all wanted to do the same. And then this, this uh, ebook came out out of an act of love, right? Everyone put their time and for nothing together and we produced this uh, freely downloadable ebook, which actually was downloaded a lot. It was a, a resource a lot of people used in the in the coming years. Now it's a bit old. <laughs> we could refresh it. And I think this is really what, um, you know, what I think if we talk about compassion, I think one condition for a compassionate global world is that we go over our own silos, right? That we really start um, taking the perspective of other fields. I mean, you know, in, in that particular example you bring up, it was art, it was contemplative practitioner, it was scientist, it was um, people who really um, uh, teach meditation. So th uh, there were clinicians. So that was already uh, quite interdisciplinary, right? There were also like, uh, you know, like artists, architects sitting in our meditation se sessions in the morning. They had never done that. For them, this was really new. And usually something really fruitful comes out of these, uh, you know, multidisciplinary. Um, endeavors, and that was also my experience with this 2011 Compassion Symposium, right? This grassroots symposium, and and later I also did the same with bridging, you know, science and economy. And that's a much more difficult endeavor, let's, <laughs> but I think really, really important, right? I think it's very important. Yeah, I mean, I think as one of the things I love about you, not only are you brilliant neuroscientist, but also this idea of bringing to people together, bridging into other disciplines what we call consilience you know what, what every person calls consilience and that's been such a major contribution and not only have you argued for it but you've made it happen in in your work and can i ask you so you you, you take a lot of the buddhist teachings into your work don't you so what got you interested in actually following the buddhist 
view of compassion and working with Mathieu? Yeah, so I, I think um, uh, the perception outside is that that I'm like based mostly in, in Buddhist teaching. And that is, of course, also true because I have learned a lot from Buddhist masters like, you know, Mathieu and Barry Kensin and the Dalai Lama and a lot of the mind and life community who is in dialogue with these different Buddhist streets. However, I have probably equally be influenced by a Christian teachings, for example, uh, brother David Steinlrast. I don't know whether you had, the, you know, the chance to meet him. Perhaps when we met in Argentina again. Yeah, and, yeah, and he is like based in gratitude, you know, in gratitude practice, and he's a Benedictine monk, but also with Zen background. And then I had different masters where I learned or where I listened to were from very different contemplative tradition and also secular tradition, right? And I think when you look at the design, for example, of the nine months longitudinal resource project, you will find elements from all these tradition uh, in a way interspersed. So I think there is a huge amount of you know, inspirations through, uh, you know, like mindfulness techniques from, from the East, compassion-based technique, but also from clinical psychology, you know, uh, other spiritual tradition, but also a lot of neuroscience in it, right? A lot of the work I did in social neuroscience on perspective taking inspired exercises we devised, you know, and I also uh, developed in addition to classic meditation, and that's something I'm very passionate at the moment about, this intersubjective format of, of inner transformation. We call them diets, you know, like dyadic partner-based. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And that, for example, was inspired by an, yet a complete other format a retreat I did, you know, privately, where these intersubjective way of of you know connecting and and yeah getting deeper and exploring your social nature your social conditioning your social triggers um is very very strongly activated and and i'm fascinated because i think everything which is about our social nature is something which i'm really passionate about because i think you cannot understand humans in isolation we are social creatures and so if you want to train or cultivate compassion, you better do it with another being who is there, you know, in your daily life with a concrete uh, interaction, because this is where all your shadows are triggered, right? This is where, uh, where your patterns, where you can become conscious about them. And I think, th so just to say, there's lots of differences. And my feeling is, and it's very much aligned with what the Dalai Lama always said. He said, compassion and love are the foundation of humanity and of being human. And then, of course, because it is so essential, all the religious tradition, but also secular ethical tradition are speaking about compassion or incorporate compassion as a, as a major force in their teachings. But compassion and love do not belong to Buddhism or to Christianity or to anyone <laughs> or any religion. It's the foundation of us human being living, right? So. I'm interested in that, right? I'm not interested in any religious, I'm inspired by many of them, but I'm not bound to any of them. And that for me was always very important because my real motivation is to work towards global compassion, no? Like how can we achieve global compassion and global compassion means it has to go beyond national borders, religious borders, you know, um, identities with, you know, with any belief system or cultural systems we are in, right? And, and so if we really want to bridge and to go beyond just like, you know, compassion for the people we like and who share our beliefs anyhow, then we need to move beyond the boundaries which religion can impose to us, no? Very much so. So look, you, you've talked a little bit about your history and the neuroscience and how you became very interested in that and time in London, and then how you've been interested in multiple different influences, you know, Buddhism and spirituality and, many, and brought that all together. And you've been engaged in some fantastic research with the, the project and so forth. So what have you learned? What, what has you, have you learned about compassion? <laughs> <What's>... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think... The first step where I learned a lot about compassion is like what I said, no, I came as an empathy researcher and I thought, oh, let's do plasticity research, you know, and we had uh, discovered that, you know, empathy, we define it as like sharing feelings with another, yeah, and the one is in pain, you feel the pain of the other or joy. So this is how we defined it. And 
I know there are many different, uh, you know, like definitions on empathy around, but we measured basically these shared brain networks, right? If someone is in pain, parts of your pain matrix lights up. And at that time, naively, I thought, oh, let's just have everyone become more empathic and do training research, plasticity research. And so I looked for these expert monks to basically inform me, this is how you do plasticity research. You look for expert pianist or violinist or whatever. And then you look whether they're, you know, like their gray matter volume in the hand areas or, is becoming bigger. And so I was looking at that time for experts in compassion and empathy. And I thought this is the same, right? Empathy and compassion. I thought it's social emotion response to suffering of others. That's it. And then I was really starting this work with Matthew Rika, with the monk, you know, you just mentioned who is translator of the Dalai Lama, but also a photographer. And he was a scientist before he was a Buddhist monk. So he knows Western science and he knows by heart all the mental, you know, like uh, meditation of, of Buddhist and Buddhist teaching. So he was the absolutely great guinea pig. I could like put him in the scanner and we could, you know, like converse and he would give suggestions of how to change the paradigm and so on. And then whenever he would go into compassion meditation, whether it's loving kindness or, you know, like for, without a focus or classical compassion, Karuna meditation, whatever, whenever he won, you know, opened this heart and compassion quality, we saw networks engaged in the brain, which comes, you know, with affiliation, warm feeling, reward, positive feeling, and not the pain network I've seen in empathy. So that was like, what's going on here? You know, what is it? And, uh, you know, we, we talked lengthily with Mathieu and I, and he explained, look, if you are a very pra long term practitioner like he is, you don't have to necessarily go through empathy and share the pain first, which, you know, for us mortals, it's usually what happens if we are confronted with pain, we feel it and we share it. But he can just jump into compassion right away. And then this is more like care, love, warmth, concern. And as you also define it, right, and I'm very much in, in line with your definition, it's a motivation. It's not a fleeting feeling. It's not like, oh, poor, poor guy. It's a real deep motivation, altruistic motivation where the focus is on the other, right? And when and, and the networks you scan when people go into this altruistic compassion motivation are totally different than, you know, like sharing the pain and coming and going. So that was revolutionary for us, for also for Mathieu, actually, he understood the difference between empathy and how fast empathy can move into distress, personal distress and, you know, being all wrapped up with the kind of, you know, like the suffering of the other gets you suffering, it becomes very uh, selfish in a way. And so what we understood is that you have to learn how to transform this initial healthy empathic response into this much more resilient, stronger motivation, right? And that this is really what we need to train and what we need to bring more into the world also for leadership i mean it's not like oh be more empathic you know if someone in your leadership team cries you know it's not about that right it is really about cultivating this love and this care and strengthening the care system and then we understood in in the resource project in this longitudinal study how powerful when you train this loving kindness, the care system, right? Like this biological, evolutionary, altruistic care system, you can train it through gratitude, through loving kindness, through compassion, through acceptance of difficult emotion. There are many roots of how you can strengthen the system. And once you strengthen the system, and we could measure that, no, because you asked, what did we learn? It is very, very powerful. It, it increases you know, cooperation, donation behavior, of course, it increases compassion, it increases, it reduces social stress to a huge amount. Um, uh, you know, it boosts your well being, um, it your thoughts are more about the other and not always me, 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 right. So you we could prove measuring thought content, that your thoughts go more like, Oh, what about the other? Uh, you know, positive thoughts about the other instead of like rumination of the past, which is often, you know, a sign of depression or depressivity. So we could see all that and we could compare that with different, you know, attention based mindfulness practice, which were less improving altruism and compassion in these socio affective qualities, right? They were good for you know, like emptying your brain, making you more present, uh, working, but they were less strong in in boosting this resilience, right? And so that was a big 
you know, learning to see how, how powerful compassion is and how, you know, like a lot of people think compassion is weak, right? And I think what I really understood is now this is the biggest force we have, you know, to, for us, it's the biggest force. Yes, I agree entirely with that. I mean, in a, you know, in our view, we see compassion as an algorithm. There's a sensitivity that's a paying attention, like all motives, you have to pay attention to threat or whatever. But then you have to do something. If you just have threat and you don't do anything. Yeah. Same with compassion. It's that doing, this, uh, this motivated wish, may you be free or, of suffering and so on. Mm -hmm. That is the that's the crucial bit. There's a question I want to ask you, though, because you talk a lot about um, the importance of compassion worldwide. But from an evolutionary point of view, compassion could be seen as a bit limited because of yeah. genetic interest, right? And you did some wonderful work with Hind, and you're looking at empathy in the brain when you see a pin gain in some yeah. hand if they're in the other team. <laughs> yes, that is that is like the that's what I call the fragility of empathy, right? And I think that this is why it's so important to distinguish between empathy and compassion. So let's unpack that a little, right? For for yeah. the audience. So given that empathy is like feeling it's feeling with whatever is, right? If someone is joyful, you have empathic joy, which is beautiful. If someone is suffering, you suffer with the other which is beautiful as well. But if you are stuck in that, it can move into empathic distress, right? And what is also the fragile thing with empathy is that it's very in-group biased, right? So it's very easy to have your empathic circuitry in the brain lighting up if someone you consider in-group, right? Like your identity. And we did these funny experiments where we showed, um, you know, it's all social psych knowledge, but in your science, it wasn't shown. So you had like seemingly a football fan from your group and we invited football fan into the scanner and on the other side was a rival football team but you only thought they were basically you know football member teams from Zurich and Basel at that time I was in Zurich Basel and Zurich they hate each other so um, and it was enough right to have in one second an empathic response to the you know to the actor were actually actors where you thought, oh, they are like, you know, they're cheering from our team. And then a, a second later, the other guy on the other side, where you thought they were from the rivalry football team, no empathy whatsoever anymore. And you had like revenge and schadenfreude, you know, schadenfreude is like a yeah. German word, but I think a lot of nations share this word is like shameful joy. If you see someone else suffering and we could record the nucleus accumbens, which is a, a, you know, very crucial reward area. And the more people said they had positive feelings seeing the other zapped with pain, right? The more the nucleus accumbens lit up, right? And, and it predicted a lack of helping later. We did more experiments in that zone. And so the more you had this revenge, schadenfreude associated um, signal in the brain, the less you would help and you know engage in action to help the other. The more empathy you had, the more you would help. So you could see how these motivation system, let's say, are very easily modulated so that Actually, you know, these were not psychopaths, right? They were normal students. And we now these studies, this in-group, out-group empathy modulation study have been replicated okay. in America and all kind of different countries. And it's very easy, right, to switch in a healthy, nice person, the empathic response to its opposite in revenge or feeling of schadenfreude. And this is another reason why compassion is so important, because when you cultivate compassion, you actually build up the muscle to forgive. You are not, it's not like, it, it's a, a strong motivation and also paired with, you know, like what the Buddhists call wisdom. And we in social neuroscience, we, we tend to say perspective taking abilities. So it's not just like, oh, there's a feeling and I'm like, you know, loving the one and hating the other, but it is also a reflective power which is needed to, to have a global compassion also towards people of outgroup members, people you don't like, people you don't know, people of different religion. And so in the resource project, we didn't have just a compassion module. We also had a three months perspective taking module. And why did we incorporate that? It's exactly because we realized it's not enough to just build on what evolutionary we had been you know, imprinted with that we love our near, you know, kinship and our, you know, like the people who are close to us. And then everything which is out group, we just make war against, right? And we see that in the world, right? We see that unfolding again and again and again. That's the reason for war, you know? Oh, this is, uh, um, 
he has another jacket, you know, and, <laughs> and you can shoot the person, you know, he has another color of uniform, you shoot the person. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, and this is what we measured in the scanner, it's just inbuilt. So how can we overcome that is really, we have to, uh, you know, um, let, let the, the, the global compassion resource grow. And for that, we need perspective taking as well. We need, if we don't like someone or someone is really, you know, having totally opposed beliefs to your own beliefs, you need to be able to, for a while, inhibit your belief take the perspective of this other person, the context in which the person is, and the context in which a person grew up, and understand, oh, this is why this person is acting like that, right? And then you, you understand deeper the motivation of the person, and instead of just saying, okay, this whole person is really bad and you need to kill this person, you can basically switch and say, we need to change the root causes of making this person bad, yeah, like the context and the causes, but we can dissociate that from the whole person, right? And and so it, I wrote an article very early about the difference between fairness and compassion. And, you know, fairness and compassion looks like two same, same, no? Like when it's fair, people are more cooperated. When you're compassionate, you cooperate more. But once fairness is violated, no? When you think this was unfair, he shouldn't have done that. La? Then you have the circle of revenge, right? You have like, and like grapple and with, with compassion that doesn't happen right if you really really move into compassion the best outcome could be forgiveness it has to be authentic it's not easy right but it that is the the path of compassion and so the outcome is totally different the predicted outcome even though they look like very close they are actually not right, and so I would say compassion is the most courageous way of being in the world. It's not weak. People say it's weak and feminine, and it's you know reserved for for children and at home and for your loving partner, but not you know for business and politics. And but actually, I think it is the most courageous thing you can have. Yes, I completely agree. We you know in our therapy we use the example of the firefighter. You know, there's nothing weak, is there, about a firefighter risking their lives to save somebody from burning? And that's obviously a, you know, so compassion varies according to context. So the way to be compassionate when you're with somebody who's dying is very different from saving somebody from a burning house. I think the yeah. point that you're making is a very, very important one, which is that we have this potential to be aware of compassion as a potential within us, but it has to be cultivated. Because if we just leave humans to their own devices, they tend to be much more regulated by their innate orientation for strategies, be it sexual or aggression or war or whatever it is. Um, so how are we, and that, you know, the, in the Buddhist position, they call it the poisons and the afflictions and so forth, how we can bring that to overwhelm, to override those sort of dispositions for the in-group and the out-group. So, can we move on to that now? So how do you see compassion coming into the world so that we can help to address some of our dark side potential? Because we have a terrible dark side, you know, with yeah. the way we treated women uh, and so on and so on. How can we bring this compassion that you have identified, with other people, that you've done a fantastic job, that it is such a power, what it is the most courageous, the wisest of all of our motivational systems. So how can we get that to sweep through the world? What are you <laughs> <laughs> that's you know i mean it's it's a question you know i'm like posing me every day when i wake up for my own you know how you know like reflecting my own what that compassion no it wasn't how could you change you know because of course we are also not living all the time walking our talks just because we are compassionate empathy researcher we're doing mistakes as well right we have our shadows and our different motivation system and you know fear and stress is always a very bad counselor for compassionate action it's actually the antidote so you know getting out of stress is the first thing to do <laughs> to open your heart again and i have answers i think on different levels let's because i think we have to look at on the individual level like just like how can how can we promote inner change so that compassion can be cultivated in schools. And I think here I have found already quite good answers because we have worked, I mean, the last years I worked on secular mental training programs and different practices of how to bring the more compassion and how to develop it, right? And the, we have almost more than 50 paper and resource project out now. We are, you know, having this cough social study where we did also like 
10 weeks digital only training of this, you know, compassion based partner exercise, this dyadic practice, right, where you have one person listening and partly the other one is exploring what was difficult and and then also moving to gratitude, like exploring two questions about difficult emotion and gratitude. So they are like training to accept difficult emotion, to integrate the difficult aspect of themselves and have a gratitude outlook of life. And then the other is just empathically listening, not judging. And then they reverse role. That's this dyadic partner. Base. And that is magic because you change every week partner. And what we did in the Kof Social project is having Berliners who were depressed and <laughs> lonely because we had followed them a whole year throughout the lockdowns in the pandemic. Wow, wow, wow. You know, and we knew about on average these thousands of Berliners we had followed with questionnaire on resilience marker and vulnerability that they were really suffering on average, right? They were really in, in especially in the second never ending lockdown of six months, depression went up, loneliness went up, fear, uh, you know, really horribly and most so for women, which a lot of COVID studies show, but also the youngest, the 18 to 25 were the most affected, the youngest cohort especially in loneliness and already before the pandemic. And I knew that, that loneliness epidemics in young people is a big problem. So we we basically made gave them something back and said 10 weeks, everyday diets and connected, you know, old Berliners with young Berliners from the study and, you know, like tube drivers with students. And, you know, like it was, and, and they did this one week, this practice every day, sharing their vulnerability, sharing their difficulties, sharing, you know, their humanity, right? And what you really see how this practice magically is increasing social connectedness, cohesion, you know, bringing people out of loneliness. We have the data now, we, we are looking at the data now, but we have already quite a few really brilliant, wonderful outcomes. Only 10 weeks, right? Only app, only digital was the first time we did that, not in person because we were in a pandemic. And so um, that is one, you know, like very concrete way I think we can, bring that into schools, we can bring that into healthcare, you know, system. I'm also running these masterclass where we do teach these, these meditation based, you know, exercises, compassion based exercise, and then people bring it at home every day, they practice with other people in their daily life in their real life with real life people, and change partner every week and do that for 10 weeks or eight weeks. And it's remarkable what it does. It, it is so magic. So I'm totally but I, I will not say this saves the world, right? But this is one approach where you can at least science-based really show that people get less lonely, less depressed, less anxious, more open, more social connected, more compassion, more health, more, less stress. So we have the data. And so I think we should just bring that into scale. So I'm advising a company, it's called humanize.com and they, they are still in their making, right? But we are training diet coaches so that this approach could be scalable for, you know, like for really bringing, you know, Americans together with, or like in America, you know, Democrats with Republicans in a diet, right? Or like young versus old. So so that these prejudices get built up, right? Uh, you know, like not built up, but uh, uh, gets down, right? Reduced because we can show that this shared humanity and this feeling of common humanity is just magically happening through this changing of partner every week you don't have to teach anything it's just you, you realize it by doing this practice right and it's only 12 minutes a day so that's one thing where i'm really engaged in trying to to help you know these startups to bring these science-based real approaches not like you know because there are many approaches they they promise transformation and they, they only do two days and without teaching and without you know safety net and without so you so my my role I see that I'm like quality I'm like trying to you know like advise so that the quality is capped you know that it not you don't sell something which doesn't work but that it's really science informed um, and so I, I I could imagine that that you know bringing that to schools to adolescents to the younger folks also can you know like through healthy digitalization approaches can can really bring them out of this subjective loneliness problem they have, right? And, and, and this unrootedness because our youth is really very fragile and, and, and meta-analysis show that it's the youngest, they are the most fragile at the moment, probably because they look into a world which will die, right? How, you, how can you, you know, be 
optimistic when you grow up into that. So that's one approach. But then this is an individual psychological approach, right? Even though you use diets and you and you form social practitioner networks, so it has also a social component to it because the idea is that you create, you know, like like what is called in Buddhist Dharma Dharma circles, you, you, but it's like secular circles of of practitioners who can help each other, no, and can sustain each other. I think we need an institutional change as well. We can't just do individual change. I was, you know, as a psychologist, always thinking, oh, individual change until I got a more powerful position in institution. <laughs> and then I think I could feel myself the power of, you know, institutional design and, and institutional DNA and the force and, you know, like the structural violence of institutions we have created, no? And, and how extremely powerful they transform good people becoming really ruthless i mean you know if you look at our dictator not every of these dictator started to be a psychopath when they were born right i mean that would be a study which was would be interesting to do but i don't think you know or let, let's say you know high level ceos or you know like um but when you look at the suffering they cause, right? And if you look also at the suffering structures we have created cause, a lot is structural violence, is, is, is institutional structures, which are all about, you know, motivation system, like competition, power, mm -hmm. achievement, you know, education system, even a healthcare system. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to work on both level on the individual change level and this is where you know we as psychologists can do a lot i think but we need to work with politician together to make them aware of the problem and to change from laws to institutional design also with people from you know like ceos um you know shareholder agreements need to be changed so that they you know they don't all just follow you know like um classical homo economicus presumption, which is just, you know, like optimizing your gains, your personal, right, investor gains. And this is, you know, as long as this is like that, it will be difficult to create good for the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to, to, you know, to get out of our zeros and really work with, you know, like the, the experts in individual change needs to work with the expert in macrostructural change, right? It is almost like a revolution which is needed, I think, there. It is, yes. I mean, I think what you're saying is, is so important, and we've got a couple of other interviews that address this whole issue of getting building communities, because the problem that you've got is exactly what you say, particularly through dominant aggressive males who control organizations, and they are pretty primate. I mean, basically, they control through threat. And I mean, the, what you can, you know, you try and get safe by complying. But what you're what we're interested in is what we call safeness, that you actually experience yourself in an environment where people will care about you and help you. Not that you're just trying to fend off threat all the time, but yeah. actually, and what I think you've been doing in the work that you've been doing is that people are starting to feel safe in their environment. There are people who are listening to me, there are people who care about me, there are people I can talk about. And that stimulates the vagus and all that stuff that you know. Exactly. And so how we create environments of safeness. I mean, in our country, our politicians have been so callous that they really destroyed most of our social services. And now the point is, it's really quite frightening that you're frightened to get old, you're frightened to get sick. You, you know, we've created a very frightening environment in the UK. So yeah. the point that you're making is such an important one. How we can get politicians to begin by how do we help people feel safe, connected and supported in their communities in their countries, that there are services there for them, health services, social services, whatever it is. And maybe getting people to do the kind of work you're doing, getting politicians to do the kind of work you're doing is important because at the moment, politicians are all macho. It's all about fighting and showing the other person that they're, they're stupid and no good. Um, and you know, I think this is also what I observed more and more. And also I could observe it in myself, you know, you are entering a system and you have lots of good intention, right? If you, <laughs> I mean, you know, even Obama, I guess he entered as a president and then he came out with gray hair, right? So um, it, very quickly, right? In one year. Or so. And um, so I think the, 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 we, we will have to look at the incentive and the structure of the system we have co-created all together. We are all together in that, right? So not pointing to, 
this is a bad guy, that's a good guy, because I think this will not really allow us, you know, this will just get us in revenge and polarization. And I think one illness we are suffering a lot and we are not aware of it is the extreme polarization we are in. And yeah. this is also partly an outcome of the unhealthy digitalization and the algorithm in social media, which are looking, you know, to polarize actually people to to increase their quick click weights, right? And that leads indirectly or even directly to an increase in, in suicide rates in, 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 in teenagers, right? And you have seen these data from America. It's like exponentially increasing in a way we have never seen before. So I think on many, many levels, we and this is actually what I try to bring into the caring economics approach, right? Perhaps just to, I realized at that time, I, you know, you know, remember, I went to Zurich because Ernst Fair, economist, microbehavioral, you know, um, he did empirical game theoretical power, uh, uh, very close to psychology in a way for an economist, right? He was a microeconomist, not a macroeconomist. And he called us and said, can we make an interdisciplinary network, psychologists, neuroscientists, economists to understand the condition for cooperation to foster and when it breaks down. So we were like, yeah, let's do it. So I was forced to go in all these economy lectures and I even had to give an economy lecture in front of lots of thousands of economy students, me as a psychologist. So I really had to learn homo economicus and you know, understand at least some of these equations and uh, to give the, the neuroeconomics course because we were bringing these fields together. And that blew my mind, right? And I started to understand more and more how the backbone of our economic system is really imprinted by a view of human nature, which is totally bizarre. It's really, as a psychologist, you're like, what? Are you really thinking that we have only one motivation system, which they call preference, right? It's like one trait. It's like, just if I like grapes today more than raisins, um, you know, that sticks for my whole life. It comes from nowhere. And, you know, it was, I mean, not, it, I'm, I'm doing a bit of a exaggeration here, but if, if you really look at the axiomatic, you know, context insensitive, endogenously given, you know, it's just optimizing your own gains. You don't know anything about the other just when you see the behavior, but you have no, you know, like empathy researcher, we measure in the brain, how unconsciously you are even contagious emotionally through your propillary or your stress without even knowing. So you are all the time representing your social nature and yourself. And the economists say, the only thing I know about the other is the behavior I have seen before. Yes. It's already crazy, right? And so there are tons of these axioms where as a psychologist, you're like, really? Are you kidding? You could say, okay, but you know, it's easier to model. It's easier to put in macro predictive model. If you would have lots of contexts, lots of motivation system, and they change every millisecond, depending on your interior milieu and the outside condition, you know, and then the behavior is not always the same because it also depends on the context, right? They would say, how, can you tell me how we should have a macroeconomic model on that and predict, you know, markets? I'm like, no, I can't because I don't think the mass is there. But the thing is that because they put mass on economics, they reduce human nature and the, and the, you know, like our view of human nature to some very egoistic, very monocyted, goal oriented uh, egoist, right? And, and most people don't know, of course, about the equation, right? About the utility function behind it. But all the policymaker are, it's the macroeconomists who are informing the policymaker. And that's what I understood in these years of cooperation is that, that the macroeconomists with their view on markets are very influential because they inform our systems, not just the finance system, but the political as well. And so even I think this view of homo economicus, which is selfish and has only this goal and has basically penetrated all our shareholder agreements, all our, you know, economic uh, endeavors, but also education and 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 you know, like how a hospital is is economically driven, right? And so there is no place for care and for social motivation and affiliation. There is no space for that. And I think this is detrimental, right? And I don't think politicians are aware that this is based on a wrong economic model, right? 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, as you know, I did my first degree in economics. And then when we did the marketing course, they would say the key of everything is to create envy. That's what you're trying to do as a marketeer. You know, if you're not creating people who want that good or see that thing, so I want that, or they've got that, I want that, I want that. If you're not creating wants, then your markets won't work. So it's a, it's, a, it's a whole economic system that's based on the creation of envy that I want something more than I've got. Otherwise, <laughs> people aren't going to buy. So the point that you're making is very, very important. And then, of course, you have envious rage that how come they've got all this and I don't? So there's a whole range of issues. But the question is, of course, yeah. bringing a, a very new motivational system. It's not about, you know, have you got more than me and I feel belittled as a result. It's really helping people recognize that maybe enough is enough that's a, that's the other key issue here and i i don't have to have what everybody else has uh, as long as i'm okay and the concept of sharing and caring not yeah. holding right this and i think for that we need you need a lot of consciousness i mean i think on the level of narrative i think narrative needs to change you know that also like for me it was for example very important to understand where this came from, right? I didn't know that our economic system is based on such a view. You know, I had to really study it and go into it to understand how deeply it's rooted there. So I think first is just to let people know, look, this is what we are buying into. Yeah. You know, and to really say, hey, do we really want that? And then to, to have people make the experience of how nourishing care is. And that is where diets, for example, this dietic work works really well because if you share vulnerability with the other, you just listen and you really care, you feel so nourished so that then you don't need so much anymore, right? Mm -hmm. You come out of the diet and you feel like, oh, that made my day, right? I don't need to eat the next chocolate <laughs> or, you know, like exactly. you are just like nourished by this true relationship, which is pure love in a way, right? But not like romantic love, but this kind of unconditional just, you know, being. and when whenever that is going on right people feel nourished they feel saturated and so i think this could break more and more the addiction loop you are talking about right if we are like always about achievement and power we are in addiction loops right and we want to have more we don't want to lose our power we don't want to lose our you know like achievement top <laughs> scores and so we are always in anxiety of losing but once you are in this affiliative care system, you you just you feel nourished, right? You feel relaxed. So I think the more we can build institutions which help to promote that, because I can tell you, I'm living in a scientific institution. It's all about competition, mm. <laughs> all the, everything. So it's very difficult if you are in an institution which is only rewarding that, really. You know, first authorship, grants, da da da, scarce resources. And then, you know, like, how should you be compassionate leadership? You know, after three years, contracts go out, da, da, da. I mean, it's in, so like the institutional design needs to be congruent with the change you want to see, no? <laughs> and, and so I really think, you know, we need to, as you said, we need to see how institutions have to change their design and also the laws and the contracts and the shareholder agreements so that they can actually allow for the safety and the soothing and the cooperation we want to see. Yes, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, from our point of view, we're moving from the primate control and hold where the dominant and aggressive get most of the, to what Karen share, which is hunter gatherer society and so forth. We're coming to the end, sadly. So let's just bring this together because it's been a fantastic overview of your work and what you're trying to do. I mean, how do you see the challenges in front of you? And what would you like to see how would you like to see your own work develop over the next years? Yeah, I think, you know, like, <clears throat> of course, I'm a fundamental researcher. So I'm like one part of me wants to continue understand more about, you know, the social brain and compassion and the training. So th the next step there, I want to, you know, bring this work to children and, you know, to developing brains to see what, you know, what can be done there. So that's the scientific part. Then there is a part which wants to bring science in translation into society, right? There was a also a siloing going on in science that we are so busy producing first author peer-reviewed whatever to survive you know publish or perish <laughs> another competitive <laughs> publish or perish you know very caring slogan but it's the slogan of our of our scientific world so you know how can you bring this into society translational to benefit arms of society so 
I'm advising a lot of startups and, you know, whenever I see they're doing good work and really want to bring. So that is one other thing where I think, you know, because it's important that scientists advise these startup, mental health startup in a right way so that it doesn't become bullshit. I mean, you know, like uh, so that they don't sell something which actually is not working or just because it has to be fast or so I think that's our duty as scientists, knowing what it needed to really change the brain or hormones or to, 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 to help advise people how to really do the inner work correctly, you know, and create the safety space and make sure that this is all allowed. So that's one th other thing. And then I would just like to continue uh, getting more involved to talk, you know, to, to economists and politicians and continue this constant you know, dialogue to really assure that on that level, things get more integrated and change, right? So that's a, a policy making, even though this is not for, I'm not paid for that, but, it, you know, in my free time, I think this is absolutely crucial, uh, you know, and to, to co-organize. And we, we, we are now in a, in a coalition, no compassion coalition together. So I hope that this, um, um, you know that this endeavor is also in the in the right direction right to to bring really all the people together who have because there are so many wonderful initiative you know compassion based initiative but they need to know each other that's right. that's you right. know and come together and ha hold their hands because alone there is nothing to be done right so it really needs to 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 become a a major narrative and i think we can only really work together right we also need to learn to be more together Right. <laughs> so that is how I see, you know, my my next steps. And then, you know, of course, you always need to to try to find your own balance and not to burn out yourself from too much passion, <laughs> you know, and just walk your talks in your everyday life, which is certainly the most difficult, right? When you're yes, yes. Well, you, you, know, you have a passion, you see, don't you? And your passion burns you. That's the thing. Exactly. So that's another thing, you know, to be always careful about okay how much how how well am i doing right now with what i'm like teaching others right so that's always a tricky balance as well and i think everyone who's passionate knows that right <laughs> so look tanya that's been wonderful now if other people want we're, we're going to put your um websites on the on the thing is of course on the um picture about it if there's any other way that people could get involved with the kind of work that you do what would you say um, yeah, so what I'm doing, but this is always like in, in Germany, like, for example, a masterclass, these are like the retreats where you can learn science based practices, and then you do eight weeks of things. So we have in 2024 for the German speaker, uh, another masterclass we offer. Uh, and in France, that's for the French speaker, healthcare worker, another one this year I'm teaching. So this is just if you really are curious to learn these practice and engage into these eight week diets. Then the other thing is, but this will be probably more mid of this year, this humanize will come out so you can start learning these diets and just subscribe and do a webinar course. And so I think I would recommend everyone who is curious about this practice to to check that out right i don't think the price will be very high they they are like all very good what people calling them? what were they what were they looking they're for? called humanize.com they are not there is not yet so much to see on the web page because they are just training their first cohorts of teachers right humanize.com but this is basically where these diet work with you know real teachers and really carefully done and with a good onboarding and a good curriculum and over 10 weeks you know like really thoroughly and and high level uh, where you can learn these diet work and then you can continue you know like through the platform to connect yourself with the other world but that's in the making so i i don't i'm not totally sure when they come out but something mid mid of this year okay and then the master class but you can you find that on my web page uh this is in february 2021 but that's the german one and the the French one is in June with Jean Gerard Bloch, who is also wonderful. He brought the whole inner work mindfulness to healthcare provider to healthcare. And I did this masterclass during the pandemic with French healthcare workers, and that was also magic. So much wonderful compassion and love and support and resilience. Um, it was very touching. Yeah. So that's something also I see a lot of, um, you know, benefit to help to help those who help the others every day, right? Yes, that's very important, isn't it? Tanya, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. 
And uh, so we look forward to talking again in the not too distant future. Yes. And, uh, as for now, uh, thank you. And um, for all the work you do, you've been a real light in the world, actually. And thank you for you being you and having, you know, started very early with compassion based approach, right? We thank you a lot. And, and, and a lot of, um, you know, therapy ba based, based on your work, right? And, and really understood the importance of compassion. So thank you as well. And looking forward to our next interaction, um, wherever that will be. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.